Hi, welcome to Helicopter Train Videos. This is an updated version of a previous video we did covering Special Federal Aviation Regulation Number 73, otherwise known as SVAR 73, and in particular the awareness training section of that regulation. SVAR 73 awareness training is the training you need to be able to touch the flight controls of a Robinson R22 or R44 helicopter. A quick outline of the video today. We'll start with an overview of SVAR 73, then we'll talk about low G and how it can lead to mass bumping. Then we'll talk about low rotor RPM and how that can lead to rotor stall. Finally, uh, energy management, and then we'll do a summary, the important things you need to take away, and more information, links and references. This is a long video, so if you want to jump ahead, click on any one of those topics right now. What's the purpose of SVAR 73? SVAR 73 is there to ensure a minimum levels of training and experience for students, pilots, and instructors in the Robinson R-22 and R-44 helicopters. This regulation doesn't apply to the new R-66 helicopter. You can find the SVAR 73 regulation in full in the latest FAR AIM book or on the government's FAA website, just Google FAA regulations, and you can follow along. You can find SVAR 73 at the start of part 61 and its full title is Special Federal Aviation Regulation Number 73, Robinson R-22 slash R-44, Special Training and Experience Requirements. Because this is a Robinson R-22 and R-44 specific regulation, we'll also be heavily referencing the R-22 and R-44 Pilot Operating Handbooks, or POH. So follow along if you have one handy, or you can view digital versions of these POHs online at the Robinson website. SVAR 73 in full covers requirements for Student Solo, Pilot in Command, or PIC, Currency, Biannual Flight Review, and being an instructor in the R-22 and R-44 helicopters. Today we're going to focus just on section 2A, which is the awareness training section, and subsections 1 through 4 inside that section. Essentially what SVAR 73 awareness training says is that no person may manipulate the flight controls of an R-22 or an R-44 for the purpose of flight unless they've received the SVAR 73 awareness training from an SVAR 73 authorized instructor. After you get this training done, you will receive an endorsement, which is basically a mini certificate signed by the instructor. That endorsement doesn't expire, and it covers both the R-22 and the R-44. SVAR 73 then goes on to list the general subject areas to be covered in that training. They list as energy management, mass bumping, low rotor RPM, blade stall, low G hazards, and rotor RPM decay. The order and the wording is not the most logical or clearest, so for this video we're going to reorder and combine those subject areas into the following sections. Low G leading to mass bumping, low rotor RPM leading to rotor stall, and energy management. Now in this video we're going to touch on some aerodynamics and more advanced helicopter concepts. So if you're new to helicopters, don't worry if you don't fully understand everything mentioned. These concepts will be subject of other future videos, and of course you can always ask your awareness training instructor to go in detail when you see them in person receiving this training. Also, at the end of the video, we're going to give you a summary of the essential items to take away from this. On to low G. So, what is low G? Well, it's the feeling when you are feeling light or weightless. Like when a roller coaster dives down, or when you're on an elevator that's going down particularly fast. It's named low G because you're feeling less than the normal 1G, or 1 gravity of downward force. Here's a diagram of a roller coaster. You can see as the roller coaster moves along and then dives down, that's where you would feel that low G situation. We can create this low G situation in a helicopter by pushing the cyclic control abruptly forward. It's called a cyclic pushover or a low G pushover. One situation that can lead to such a maneuver is the pilot pushing forward on the cyclic to follow terrain. As you can see here, the aircraft's been going along as the hill drops away. The pilot could push forward with the cyclic and that would create this low G situation as he tried to follow the terrain. Another possible situation is the pilot pushing forward on the cyclic to uh, avoid a collision, perhaps with a bird or another aircraft. Low G can also be caused by a pushover after a climb, so as the aircraft's following up, uh, maybe up the terrain, and as the aircraft wants to level out, the pilot may push forward and cause that low G situation. Turbulence, rapid upward and downward movements of air currents can also lead to a low G situation, and we'll talk more about turbulence later. Talking about low G arising from collision avoidance and pushover after a climb, here we have uh, excerpts from safety notice number 29 in the R22 and R44 pilot operating handbook. This safety notice warns about low G situations being more likely in airplane pilots learning to fly helicopters, 
because in an airplane it's a normal reaction to push forward for collision avoidance and to terminate climb. But that automatic response, to quote Robinson, can be deadly when flying a helicopter. Regardless of your previous flight experience, R-22 and R-44 pilots must never abruptly push the cyclic stick forward. So what's the big deal about low-G? Why is it so dangerous? Well, low-G can lead to a very serious and usually deadly situation called mass bumping. Let's see how this happens. Firstly, the helicopter enters a low-G situation, perhaps due to an abrupt forward cyclic input or low-G pushover. The low-G condition unloads the rotor disc, allowing the body of the helicopter and the rotor disc to move relatively independently. Because of this, and the fact that the tail rotor is above the center of gravity, the tail rotor thrust now causes the body of the helicopter to drastically roll to the right, while the rotor disc remains relatively unaffected. That roll rate can be as high as 100 degrees a second. The pilot may instinctively try to correct the right roll with left cyclic input, but this causes the rotor disc alone to tilt left, leaving the body of the aircraft tilted to the right, or rotating to the right, thus actually causing the rotor head to strike the rotor mast and cause mast bumping. Mast bumping often causes separation of the rotor disc from the rotor mast. Also, the excessive blade flapping can cause blade contact with the body of the helicopter, both situations often being fatal. The R-22 Pilot Operating Handbook, Section 4-15, describes mast bumping as excessive main rotor flapping resulting from low G or abrupt control input. And that excessive flapping can lead to main rotor separation from the helicopter. Let's say we have inadvertently got ourselves into low G. We feel light in the seat and the helicopter starts a right roll. What's the correct response? Correct recovery is to resist the urge to fix the roll by applying left cyclic and instead make an immediate but gentle aft or back cyclic to reload the disc. As we feel heavy in our seat, we've established positive G-forces and now it's safe to correct that roll. Of course, a better situation would be to avoid low G in the first place. Let's talk about this thing some more. In the R22 and R44 POH, in section 2-6, in the limitations section, it states, low G cyclic pushovers are prohibited. It also placards that on the cyclic control itself as a reminder to the pilot. 2-6 also describes a pushover and how in a low G situation, it's gentle aft cyclic that should be used to reload the rotor disc before applying lateral cyclic to stop the roll. Here we have some more excerpts of other very informative and important references to low-G from the R-22 and R-44 POH. They include safety notice number 11, which explains the hazards of low-G and warns pilots never to demonstrate or experiment with low-G, and that even highly experienced test pilots have been killed investigating the low-G condition. And a clear reminder at the bottom, never perform a low-G pushover. Also, safety notice number one from the POH reminds pilots to avoid cyclic pushovers by always using the collective not the cyclic to initiate a descent. So lower collective to descend, do not push forward as you might do in an airplane. And finally, a couple of other excerpts that deal with low G and turbulence. Safety notice number 32 talks about the hazards of high winds or turbulence and how the pilot's improper response can increase the likelihood of mass bumping. It also covers recommended procedures when flying in turbulence, such as reducing airspeed to 60 to 70 knots and not to over control. An airworthiness directive that's an AD 952604 from the R22 POH discusses procedures for flight and turbulence and reminds the pilots not to over control and to eliminate sidestep that's flying out of trim. It also instructs the pilots to depart the area of turbulence if possible or consider a precautionary landing. That same airworthiness directive that applies to the R22 and not the R44 also has some wind, gust and turbulence restrictions that apply to new R22 pilots. More information can be found at the end of the limitations section of the R22 POH. We don't show student pilots low G in flight, it's far too dangerous. But as a flight instructor, I do try to train my students on low G recovery by simulating the uncommanded right roll due to low G and then to see how they react. Here's one quick example. This is the way it's going to work. You're going to be on the controls, but I'm yeah. just going to simulate what we're going to do. Okay. So I'll say to you, okay, let's imagine we're just flying through turbulence and you start to, so you suddenly start to feel very light yeah. in the aircraft and it starts an uncommanded right roll. Okay. Okay, and I will then, I'm going to simulate that. I'll say, okay, we're feeling suddenly light in our seat, we get an uncommanded right okay. roll and we've got to come back. Okay. Half cycle, okay. feel heavy. Okay. And then gradually roll back okay. to the left and bring the airspeed back in. And we don't okay. want to get into another, we don't want to get into a low G situation trying to get that airspeed back by pushing forward quick. And then you've got to think about, now what do I need to do to get out of this situation of turbulence 
Do I need to slow down to 60 to 70? Do I need to get away from the backside of this hill? Do I need to think about making an emergency landing? I also try to demonstrate in flight how easy it might be for a pilot to do a, a cyclic pushover for collision avoidance or terrain following. I got him. Good job. So let's talk about this terrain following, right? Let's say yeah. that we wanted to then follow this down on the other side. You could see how people might just push forward and over the top here, right? Oh, yeah. So follow along with the controls. Okay. What we want to do, if we want to follow this terrain, we've got to lower that collective. Okay. As we lower the collective, maybe pull full carb heat if we need to. Okay. Okay, enough about low G and mass bumping. Let's look at low rotor RPM and rotor stall. At the very basic level, helicopters fly by the main rotor turning fast enough to pull air down through the rotor disc and create lift. The speed of the blade spinning is measured in revolutions per minute, or RPM. The R-22 and the R-44 helicopters have a normal main rotor RPM of about 530 RPM for the R-22 and 410 RPM for the R-44. The rotor RPM is monitored using cockpit instruments called tachometers or tacks. You can see examples of both the R22 and R44 tacks here on the screen. Notice how they show the RPM as a percentage rather than actual numbers of revolutions per minute. Low rotor RPM is when the main rotor slows down below normal operating limits. Normal power on or engine running operating range for the R22 is between 101 and 104 percent and it's 101 and 102 percent in the R44. In either aircraft, the normal power on range is displayed as a green band. So you hear the expression, keep it in the green, or top of the green. That's referring to keeping the RPM in the normal range. When RPM is allowed to drop below normal operating range, one of the initial problems is a reduction in lift. The helicopter will start to settle. That alone could lead to a dangerous situation. If low RPM is not corrected and allowed to develop further, it can lead to an extremely dangerous and all too often fatal situation known as low RPM rotor stall. Here we have excerpts from the R22 and R44 POH safety notice number 24. Low RPM rotor stall in a helicopter is similar to an airplane stall. If the wing or rotor blade meets the incoming relative wind at too high an angle, which is called the critical angle of attack, then the airflow separates from the airfoil and the airfoil is said to be stalled producing very little lift and lots of drag. In a helicopter, that increased drag further slows down the rotor system. In a helicopter, low RPM rotor stall can occur at any speed. And if it occurs, the helicopter quickly settles and the uprush of air through the rotor system further increases the angle of attack, making recovery almost impossible. And to quote Robinson's Safety Nurse 24, the aircraft literally falls out of the sky. A caution in section 4-10 of the POH states that catastrophic rotor stall that's unrecoverable could occur if the rotor RPM ever drops below 80% plus 1% per thousand feet of altitude. So here in Bend, Oregon, unless we're going up into the mountains, we're usually cruising around at about 4,000 to 5,000 feet. So critical, unrecoverable rotor stall could occur within rotor RPM range of about 84 to 85%. Obviously we want to avoid this situation, so let's look at what can cause low RPM. The R-22 and R-44 helicopters have an electronic device called the governor. That governor manipulates the engine throttle to maintain RPM in the normal range. But the pilot is able to override the governor by gripping the throttle control. This can lead to a pilot over-gripping or death-gripping the throttle, especially with a new or anxious pilot. This would stop the governor from assisting the pilot to main RPM, maintain RPM and may lead to low RPM. Another possible cause is the pilot simply rolling the throttle down inadvertently or incorrectly. Here we have a couple of excerpts from the section 7-4 of the POH. The governor works best with smooth, slow control inputs. If the pilot makes aggressive control inputs, especially up collective, the sudden added drag to the system may pull the RPM down quicker than the governor can respond, leading to low RPM. The situation is made worse by operating in high density altitudes. That's where the air is thinner on hot days or when operating at higher altitudes. Robinson's POH mentions above 4,000 feet. Here in Bend, in the height of summer, we can get days where the density altitude is above 7,000 feet before we even take off. And even with slow and smooth collective inputs, I've experienced slow governor response leading to low RPM in both the R22 Beta 2 and the Raven 2 uh, R44. This is why we train to better recognize and recover from low RPM. It's not just theory, it does happen. The aircraft may also be operating close to the limitations of the engine, and if the pilot exceeds the limitations by pulling up too much collective, known as overpitching, the engine may be at full throttle and unable to meet the extra demand, leading to low RPM. 
7-4 of the POH talks about overpitching by explaining how at higher power settings above 4000 the throttle is often wide open. In such a situation any RPM decay must be controlled by lowering the collective as there is no more throttle. Safety tip number 13 mentions how above three or 4000 feet the throttle is often wide open and as already mentioned the governor response rate is fairly slow. We will talk about power limitations in more detail in the energy management section of this video. Like all electronic devices, governors can fail or malfunction, so it's also possible that the governor fail or malfunction can cause low RPM. Although rare, engines and drive systems can partially or fully fail, again leading to RPM decay. Finally, in an auto rotation, the helicopter glides using the upward airflow through the rotor system to keep the rotors turning rather than the engine, and the RPM is controlled by, by the pilot primarily using the collective. The pilot can therefore make incorrect inputs in the autorotation, which would also cause low RPM. R22 POH 4-15 has some more information on low RPM rotor stool, reminding the pilot of conditions that can lead to low RPM to include aggressive maneuvering, high collective angle, often the result of high density altitude over pitching, which we talked about was exceeding power available, during climb or high forward airspeed, and slow response to the low main rotor RPM warning horn and light which we will talk about later. The effects can be amplified, of course, in turbulence. Low RPM is something helicopter pilots train to recognize and recover from to the point where it becomes an instinct. Whatever the cause, as rotor RPM decays, you should be able to hear a lowering pitch in the sound of the engine and the rotor system. You'll also sense an increase in vibrations, and depending on airspeed and maneuver, maybe a feeling of descending. The R22 and R44 helicopters have a low RPM warning system consisting of a horn and a caution light. That system comes on at 97% RPM. On recognizing low RPM, the pilot should instinctively and immediately attempt to recover RPM. To do that, roll on the throttle while simultaneously lowering collective. We roll on the throttle to drag it more power from the engine to increase RPMs. We lower the collective to reduce the drag in the system, and it may be that we are at full throttle, so the only way to regain RPM is lowering the collective. But be careful here. If you just lower collective and do not roll on the throttle, the correlator, which is a linkage between the collective and the throttle, will actually reduce the throttle as you lower collective, potentially causing RPM to decay further. So you must roll the throttle on as you lower the collective. Also, if you have sufficient forward airspeed, you can come aft or back with the cyclic to flare the helicopter, converting some forward airspeed to help regain some of the rotor RPM. POH section 3-10 covers the emergency procedure, or EP, for low RPM. As previously stated, it says roll the throttle on, lower collective, half cyclic if in forward flight. If RPM decays and the helicopter starts to settle, the pilot may instinctively but incorrectly try to pull up collective to reduce the descent. But as already mentioned, the extra drag in the system slows the blades further, making the situation worse. Safety tip number 9 reminds the pilot to preserve rotor RPM by lowering collective, even if that means making a hard landing. Safety notice number 10 in the POH reminds the pilot no matter what the cause of low RPM, the pilot must instantly roll on throttle and lower collective simultaneously and then investigate the problem. And as we said, half cyclic and forward flight can also flare the aircraft to convert some airspeed to RPM. We regularly train on low RPM recognition recovery in forward flight and in a hover. Here's a couple of examples of both. Okay. okay, so we're going along about 70 knots yep. and I start to give myself low RPM by rolling the throttle down. I wait till I hear the horn, even though now I can feel it, hear it, okay, lowering whilst rolling on, and it's really a very small amount of both. Okay. Do right. it one more time, and this time I'm going to show you half cyclic as well, but we'll come back to that in a second. So okay. we're flying along 65, okay, starting to roll down, low RPM, half cyclic while rolling on, half cyclic we know will build it up. Okay. We're about four feet up, I'm going to start rolling the throttle down, but I'm going to use the collective to hold position. There's the horn, so the recovery is roll on while simultaneously lowering a little bit. And then if I need to, I'll do a little bit more roll on and then I'll hold it back. Okay, so let's have a look at energy management. As already mentioned, helicopters fly by the rotation of the main rotor blades at the correct RPM to provide enough lift. So energy management is about managing the energy available by the engine to maintain the correct rotor RPM, while trying to also keep safe reserves of energy in altitude, airspeed and rotor RPM to maintain rotor RPM in the event of an engine failure or drive failure. So really we have two energy management scenarios, power on or engine turning the rotor blades and power off or auto rotation. 
We've already discussed how allowing rotor RPM to decay will cause the helicopter to settle and can lead to critical low RPM rotor stall. We've also discussed how one situation that can lead to low RPM is by over pitching and so exceeding the power available from the engine. That would be bad power on energy management. We can avoid this situation with proper pre-flight preparation by looking up the available manifold pressure for the current conditions as well as the in-ground effect and out-ground effect hover ceilings and having a good grasp of the wind conditions and how they can positively and negatively affect the aircraft. Those charts and wind conditions they will be covered in, in future videos. Now let's look at power off energy management. Helicopter engines are extremely reliable but like any piece of equipment failures can happen. In the event of an engine or a drive failure the helicopter enters an auto rotation when now the blades are being turned by the air rushing up through the rotor disc as the helicopter descends. In an auto rotation three forms of energy can be used to maintain adequate rotor RPM until safely on the ground. Firstly potential, that's altitude above the ground. So we'll trade the altitude for rotor RPM by descending down through the air. The movement of that airflow through the rotor disc will keep the rotor spinning. Obviously the higher you are the more energy you have and the longer time you have in the air and that could be critical for being able to choose a good spot to make a landing to get that mayday call out maybe try an air restart secondly kinetic or airspeed that's the horizontal movement of the helicopter through the air that can also be converted to rotor rpm by flaring the helicopter we'll explain a bit more in a second about that one and the faster the helicopter is moving the more energy will be available finally inertia of the blades themselves this is by far the smallest energy reserve and in the R22 Blade inertia by itself would provide enough energy to keep the rotors producing lift for about one or two seconds before rotor stall occurs. We start the auto rotation at altitude, and that's our first form of energy that we will trade for rotor RPM as we descend towards the ground. The air rushing up through the blades keeps the rotors spinning like a windmill effect, and so producing some lift. So although we're falling, we're falling at a controlled rate. Also, the helicopter controls still fully respond to allow the helicopter to pitch, roll, and yaw as normal. We just can't climb back up. Now, we're out of altitude, maybe around 40 feet above the ground. At this point, we come back or aft with the cyclic control to flare the helicopter. The flare will reduce our descent rate and slow our forward movement while trading airspeed to maintain rotor RPM. In the final stage of an auto rotation, about 8 feet above the ground, we've traded all of our altitude and airspeed for rotor RPM. And as we settle to the ground, we cushion the fall by using the energy stored in the inertia of the rotor system itself to provide rotor RPM for the last few feet to a nice safe landing. Section 4-10 of the R22 POH reminds pilots that the R22 has a light, low inertia rotor system and that most of the energy required for a successful load rotation is in airspeed, not the rotor. We know that altitude, airspeed and rotor RPM or inertia are reserves to be used in a power failure. So smart energy management means keeping good, safe reserves of that energy. That would mean flying at least 500 feet above the ground as a good minimum for altitude reserves. The other advantage of flying above 500 feet above the ground is that it should help you keep clear of one of the leading causes of fatal helicopter accidents, wire strikes. Above 500 feet we're also less likely to get noise complaints. Maintaining at least 60 knots airspeed will help ensure we have good kinetic reserves. And finally making sure we're keeping the rotor RPM in the green. That's 101 to 104 in the R22 and 101 to 102 percent in the R44. That will ensure that we have enough rotor inertia to cushion our landing. Another way to ensure safe reserves of energy for a possible water rotation is as much as possible to fly outside the shaded areas of the height velocity diagram. We will cover this chart in another video in more detail, but essentially it's a make and model specific chart that shows shaded areas as airspeed and altitude above ground level where the chances of a successful water rotation are in doubt. The chart also has a recommended takeoff profile. This one comes from the R22 Pilot Operating Handbook section 5-11. We talked about safe reserves being 500 feet above the ground and 60 knots. I've highlighted that area on the chart with a green circle. As you can see it places the pilot well clear of the shaded areas of the diagram. The green line I've highlighted at the bottom of the chart is the recommended takeoff profile. It's basically saying you should remain below 10 feet until reaching about 40 to 50 knots and then start to climb out. If you stay below 10 feet above 50 knots then you start to get into the bottom shaded area which I've highlighted in red because at that speed and altitude you will not have enough time or room to enter an auto and flare before contacting the ground. We apply this recommended takeoff profile in our normal takeoffs in the R22 and the R44. We accelerate to about 45 knots and then start to come up and climb out to about 55 to 65. As I said, we'll talk about this diagram in other videos. 
So this video is aimed at viewers with various levels of helicopter experience. If you're new to helicopters and some of the things mentioned in this video escape you, don't worry, you'll receive one-on-one -on -one awareness training with an SFAR 73 certified instructor who will better answer any of your questions. But if you take away anything from this video, it should be the following. Rotor RPM is critical to keeping a helicopter flying, so to that end, do not pull up aggressively on the collective control. Do not death grip the throttle control. Keep safe reserves of altitude and airspeed. Fly within the helicopter's performance limitations. And to help avoid low G, do not abruptly push forward with a cyclic. For most maneuvers in a helicopter, all control inputs should be small and smooth, so that alone should help keep you away from low G and low RPM. For new R22 and R44 pilots, I hope you realize the purpose of awareness training is not to scare you, but to educate and protect you. And remember, you'll be thoroughly trained to avoid and deal with hazards of flight and emergency procedures before you're allowed to solo. Flying helicopters is great fun. You just need to remember your training and to be vigilant. Here we have some more uh, information for you. I thoroughly encourage you to read more up on the subjects that we've talked about today in the R22 and R44 pilot operating handbook, especially the safety tips and safety notices. Other recommended information would be SVAR 73 to Part 61 in the FAR AIM or in the FAA regulations website. The latest FAA helicopter flying handbook under the emergencies and hazards section. And then we have three video links to Frank Robinson talking about low G mass bumping, low rotor RPM, rotor stall, and energy management. Frank Robinson being the creator of the R22 and R44 helicopters. And of course we have the helicopter training videos website more information there. Any questions, corrections, feedback, please get in touch.